Hello and welcome to the Career Speakeasy, a casual, fun, and irreverent place to share ideas about career development, the world of work, and life in general. I'm your host and proprietress, Kelly Nottingham. Growing your career should not be boring. So come on in, pull up a chair, and pick your poison. Hi everyone, today's episode is going to be a little bit different from previous episodes because today is my brand new first top 10 list. Specifically, we're going to run through my current top 10 training tips. Please note I said current. That means I can add on to this list at any time. I like to keep my options open. So thanks to listener Joshua Tool for suggesting training as a topic. If you have ideas for topics you would like to suggest, please email me at careerspeakeasy at gmail.com. Here we go. Many of you already know that I have spent the majority of my career in training and development, working with companies of all kinds, from very small nonprofits all the way to large Fortune 100 companies, teaching everything from leadership presence to forklift safety, and I'm not even joking. And in that time, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've learned a lot of things the hard way. And frankly, I'm still constantly learning all the time. After all, training and learning are directly tied to neurology, and researchers are continually discovering new ways that the brain works. There's one big example of this later in the podcast, just as a little teaser. Now, because there's so much to know about how adults learn most effectively, I completely expect to end up doing a bunch of training episodes over the course of this podcast. And some of them will probably contradict previous ones because that's the way learning works, right? As I learn more, I will share that info with you. Uh, I can start off right now with a book recommendation for those of you who want to dig into training and adult learning a little bit more. It's a great book called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Brown, Rodiger, and McDaniel. And it has fantastic discussions about adult learning, information retention, and implementation of training practices. Okay, so without any further ado, here are my top 10 training tips in no particular order. These can be used for big formal training sessions as well as one-on-one onboarding or casual peer learning, uh, like teaching your coworker how to work the copier. Number one, this first one is a big foundational piece. Training is not just giving information. Training is giving information so that the audience does something with the information. So many trainers are taught, and I was taught this as well, that training is all about giving them all of the information possible with a goal that they understand the information. And that's usually in the agenda or the learning goal somewhere, that word understand. Well, understanding is important, obviously, but if the learners don't do anything with the information, either putting it into practice or building on it to achieve some end, then the training isn't going to be considered successful, especially in a business setting. Even if you think about a hobby, it's not enough just to understand what we're trying to do with our hobbies, with our philosophy learning. I teach dance classes, right? And it's not enough to get my dance students to understand a movement or to understand where a particular dance style comes from. I want them to use that information somehow, either by doing the movement correctly or performing that particular dance style, or at the minimum, to at least recognize it when they see it again. We don't teach communication skills so people understand how to communicate. We want them to actually communicate using those skills. So if your training is focused only on understanding, here's the big question to ask yourself. What do you want your learners to do differently after the training is done? Then tell them what they need to do differently during the training so they understand that from the start. Now, as a side note, this comes up a ton when I'm asked for team building events. Team building should be toward a tangible goal, not just, well, they need to work better together. I want them to work more as a team. How do you want them to work differently? Is it dealing with conflict effectively? Is it clearer goal building together? Even socializing kinds of team building can have a goal if you focus it on something like 
By the end of this session, everyone will know everyone else's name and their area of expertise. Now that doesn't take away from the fun of a team building session. It just gives it a purpose. And that is a beautiful thing. Number two, know your audience. Once upon a time, I went to a fundraising event for breast cancer research. It was a fancy black tie sort of event. And the organizers had managed to engage a cancer researcher to come speak to us. Now, I don't know if this researcher didn't know who her audience was going to be if that wasn't shared with her in advance, or if this honestly was the only level that she could speak about her research. But it was so far over everybody's heads that 99% of the audience was glazed over after about two minutes. She got into tremendous detail about glial some things and DNA. I, I, I had no idea what she was talking about. I'm sure what she was saying was important stuff. It was cutting edge research. But the vast majority of the audience, we weren't clinical researchers. And because of that mismatch, the speech wasn't a success. So based on our point number one, you already know what the audience is supposed to do differently after the session. So now you need to ask yourself some different questions. Who are my audience members? What do they already know about the topic? Why should they want to learn this? So what's in it for them? Why is it important to them? And what might their resistance points be to the topic? In other words, why might they not want to learn or to do these things? These questions can help set your agenda for your session. Once you have an idea of what they already know, you can start to build on that with what they now need to know. Adults learn best when their learning relates to something that they already know, that they've already put into practice in their lives. They know why they need to learn new information and they know what to do with the new information that they're getting. So don't do your training in a vacuum where you don't know who your audience is. Asking questions about why they would want to learn this, what their resistance points are, those things can help you formulate your discussions from the very beginning so you can address their concerns early enough that they aren't sitting there for the whole session feeling frustrated and mentally or out loud arguing about the point of the training. List item number three. This will come as no surprise, but our average attention span is microscopically small nowadays. Researchers are finding that the more information we have available to us, the less time we spend on it. Uh, and sadly, frankly, most of us were educated in a sit and listen kind of setting, which isn't good for information retention or application after training. So we have to figure out kind of a balance between expecting somebody to sit for a really long time and having these really short attention spans. If you look at your average TV show, they go for about seven to eight minutes before they take a commercial break. Now, for those of us who stream our TV without commercials, uh, we don't necessarily have those seven or eight minutes of short attention span to focus on a show, but we're probably sitting there in front of our TV and we're probably holding at least one other screen in front of us, either a laptop or a phone or a tablet, and we're surfing the web, we're on social media, we're playing with an app, all at the same time while that TV show is running. So all of this to say, expect people to lose focus after about eight to 10 minutes of talking max. The practice of what's called in the training world, chunking your training uh, comes into this. Chunking means looking at your training content and basically breaking it into small segments with activities or discussions in between. As you are building out your training, this may feel tedious to have to do this, especially when you have just written the official most gorgeous slide deck ever to have to break it down into chunks and add in interactions between, but your training will have way more impact if you do. Number four. If the idea of adding a ton of interactions is making you think, but Kelly, I won't have time to get through all of my information. This is where we talk about limiting the main points of your training, the things you need for them to know how to do when they leave the training class. 
you need to limit those main points down to about three or four per training. Nobody's going to remember 15 main points. And yes, I see the irony of telling you this during a top 10 list, but hey, you can re-listen to this as needed. But in other episodes, if you've listened to some other episodes, I actually use this technique by limiting the number of objectives that I want to get through in one episode of a podcast down to three, maybe four max. The reason we do this is because it keeps us focused on a manageable amount of content where our brains can take it in and really process it. Anything else gets reserved for a different episode or a different training class. So if now you're saying to yourself, okay, so you're telling me I need to chunk down my content and I need to limit the amount of content that I'm covering, what if I don't have enough information to cover? Don't worry, we have that covered in our next couple of points on the list. So number five, you have your training broken down into little chunks. Don't just give them that one info chunk and then it's gone into that great training room in the sky. Revisit it, review it, bring it back multiple ways in different activities and content reviews and games and discussions. In fact, a best practice is to interweave your chunks of information together in multiple ways. This will actually help your learner to remember the information better and be able to apply it into new situations. So again, we're trying to link new info to older info that they already have. So if you've covered topic A 30 minutes ago, you can now link topic B to topic A by showing how they relate. And you review topic A after you cover topic B, then you cover topic C, and then you play a game that pulls all three of those together at once. This may sound intimidating as I'm walking through this, but honestly, just trying to touch on the information that you've already given in multiple ways at different points in your training is going to help your learners to internalize that training and solidify it in their heads. Number six, speaking of using new info in new ways, one of the best ways to develop knowledge retention and knowledge application is to let your learners play with your new training ideas. Let them practice using their new skills in different ways. So here's an example of what I mean. While training a three-day workshop for a large company, I had taught this workshop a zillion times. There was one segment of the training that was just absolutely brutal to get through. It was day two of a three-day training in the afternoon after lunch. Everybody was tired. Everybody was struggling to stay awake and focused. Everybody, including me. I didn't take it personally. If I had been sitting in a seat and I had just eaten a big lunch and I had already gone through a day and a half of training, I would have been totally done by that point too. Now that four hour segment of training was on problem solving and decision making. And it had very little interaction originally built into the content, which made it even harder to get through because it was just basically two hours of lecture, a bathroom break, and two hours of lecture. So I went back to an activity that I had developed years before for a completely different workshop on a different topic. And I repurposed that activity with the goal of getting them to try out their new problem solving skills. It was a simple simulation activity about a made up company that had all kinds of horrible processes in every one of their imaginary departments. Each of the departments was described on a poster on the wall and each table was magically transformed into a consulting firm that had a problem that they had to try to solve. Now, what I did not tell them when they were doing this activity is that the goal wasn't to get a right answer. It was for them to practice their new problem-solving model in a different pretend setting. Once they tried to solve the problem and they came back and we talked through their solutions, we then talked about how it went for them to work through that problem solving model. It was a great success because everybody was ready to try something new in that segment of the training and they got to really have fun. They got to chat with their new friends and their groups. They got to get up and move around and to really just play with the idea a little bit. They got to have some fun. 
Tip number seven. Of course, we can't just focus on socializing the whole time we're in a training class. We have to make sure that they're getting the information they need and that they know what to do with it. And how do we know that? By asking them if they enjoyed the training? Nope. Even though, unfortunately, a lot of the time when we look at training evaluations, they're what we call smile sheets, where you say, hey, did you have fun today? Did you enjoy it? How was the room? How are the snacks? Was everything good? Okay, great. Rate your facilitator on a scale of one to five. Have a good day. Now, of course, you want them to enjoy the training, but that's not enough. You need to find a way to measure if they've actually gotten the information and did something with it. Now, I'm not going to get into this much because honestly, this is a whole separate huge workshop on its own. Measuring training effectiveness is a massive topic, but I will say this. You don't have to be a statistician and put people through 14 different surveys to see if they learned what they needed to. One very simple way to do this is to do a pre-test and a post-test on the information covered in the training. Yes, most people will fail the pretest. That's the point. If they don't fail the pretest, you may need to revisit exactly what needs to be covered in the session because they may already know the majority of what you are planning to cover. Ideally, you want them to not do well on the pretest and then do great on the post test. So these types of little quizzes can show you where the training is working and where it's not. Again, getting into longer term retention and application is another massive subject. But it can be done even using the same little quiz given several times throughout the next coming weeks or months after the training. But ideally, you'd be able to look at some type of work or process metrics to see the long-term success of the training. So if the training, for example, is around reducing wait times on customer service calls and you're doing training with your customer service staff, you can compare the training group's average wait times before versus after the training to see a difference. Now, there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot you can go into, so I'll just leave it at that. But the key point is you want to make sure you're trying to measure what they learned in the session beyond just whether they had a nice time. One fun way to do this is to have them try to solve a problem related to the training topic at the very beginning of the session. Again, this is a different take on that pre and post test. Give them a problem to solve and let them fail at solving the problem and then have them resolve the same problem at the end. You can time them. You can look for how well they did to see improvement. So that's just an idea. Tip number eight is another way to look at effectiveness of training and is a way to design your training is to think about stories and how to use stories in your training to make it much more attractive and memorable. Humans have always learned through stories. We've heard the story of the tortoise and the hare all our lifetime, right? We are familiar with Aesop's fables and fairy tales, which were originally way darker and more cautionary tale than they're portrayed in cartoons nowadays. But humans love stories and we remember them. So as you work through the design of your training and you're focusing on how you can get your audience to care about the topic, how you can get them to relate it to their own situation and applications at work. Think about stories you can tell to help them remember key points and see ways to use that subject matter in different ways. For example, I've actually already told several stories in this episode. Effective stories are relatable, they're to the point, and they're memorable. And here's a trick. You don't even have to come up with your own. You can ask the group if anyone has an example of a time when they blank and let them come up with a story that you can then revisit throughout the training to reinforce the points you're making. Number nine on our list. As we've gone through the list thus far, some of you may be surprised that I have not talked about learning styles yet. You know, you've probably taken quizzes or taken workshops on this. I know I've taught workshops on this. Deciding whether you're an auditory, visual, or kinesthetic learner? Well, there's a reason I haven't talked about that, y'all. Neuroscientists and researchers have not been able to prove that learning styles actually exist. In fact, studies have shown that people can lock themselves into thinking that they can't learn any other way. So talking about learning styles can actually be counterproductive. 
So we're going to throw that idea out the window. Don't be upset. We all believed it because it was the best idea we had at the time. And, you know, we still have preferences. We can still have preferences for how we learn. I definitely learn faster using visuals. But having that box of I learn this way as an idea has gone away. The good thing is that science is continuing to learn more. Science is now focused on understanding different types of intelligences. So, for example, spatial, interpersonal, intrapersonal, logical, mathematical, bodily kinesthetic, and the list goes on. At last count, I think they had come up with nine. That number is bound to change as we continue to learn more about how the brain works and as we continue to put people in you know, MRI machines and watching their brains interact with different stimuli, we continue to learn. So what does this mean for us? It means that in our training sessions, we can relax on trying to mash our training into traditional learning style categories. The best way to learn is going to be individual for each person. We can use multiple teaching methods to reach different types of intelligences. There is so much on this. I'm sure I'm going to be doing an example wholly devoted to it at some point in time. Uh, But if you're interested in learning more, again, the book Make It Stick actually has a section on this. All right, so list item number 10. We're at the last on the list, and we are ending on another crucial tip for teaching adults. Trainers talk less. Let the learners talk more. Now, this should be a relief to everyone leading a training class because it takes time and pressure off of you as the person running the class. But for a lot of people who aren't as used to training with activities, this can feel super scary because you feel like you're giving up control of the room. What if they get out of control? What if I can't get them to sit back down or stop talking? What if I can't figure out how to tie in their ideas with the main points? What if they all rebel and run out of the training and the whole thing falls apart? Oh, yes. It can be scary to tell a group to just go do the thing, and we will talk back again in 15 minutes. In fact, the story I told earlier about the little fake company exercise with all the problems to be solved, whenever I had guest facilitators come in to help with that three-day workshop, almost none of them wanted to do that session because they were so afraid of that one activity. No matter how many times I tried to explain to them, Look, this activity is giving you a half hour coffee break in the middle of it where you just wander around and answer questions and you don't have to be like in front of the room working really hard. Once they led it for the first time, though, they realized how liberating it is for both the trainer and especially for the participants to get to take charge and own their own learning. So let them do it. Set your ground rules or whatever you want to call them set a timer, give them instructions, and then let them talk to each other. Let them learn from each other. That's often, honestly, where the most important learning happens. And for those of you who have experience in the front of a classroom, you can probably testify this is where the trainer also learns a lot. Listening to what the learners already know, listening to the ideas they're coming up with and how they're processing those ideas how they're thinking about ways to implement the ideas when they get back to their workplace. It's incredible what, as a trainer, you can learn from letting your learners run the show for a little while. So that's my current top 10 list on best training techniques and tips. So now it's time for last call. If you train on anything, and I mean anything, Take a listen to this list and think of a way to implement at least one of these topics into your training. Heck, even if you don't train anything at work, but you're teaching your kids how to do laundry, try using a tip from the episode with them. Most of the tips listed here can help in any situation where you're trying to help someone learn a new skill or learn a new idea. Now, if you're a more seasoned trainer, take a look at a workshop or a training class that maybe you haven't taught in a while and see how you can make it more engaging. You get double points if training is virtual or online because that creates a whole nother list of best practices that, again, I'm sure I will be getting to at some point. 
If you decide to give any of these ideas a try, I would love to hear about it from you. Please email me and let me know. Until then, happy training. Well, thanks for joining me. If you have suggestions, feedback, or just something random you want to share, email me at careerspeakeasy at gmail.com and come visit again soon. Cheers. Cheers.